I'm uh, Telford Work, Emeritus Professor of Infectious and Tropical Diseases at UCLA, formerly Chief of Virus Diseases at the CDC, then the Centers for Disease Control. Prior to that, nine years with the Rockefeller Foundation Virus Program in uh, Egypt and India. And uh, prior to that, a year and a half in the Fiji Islands. Uh, after getting out of uh, five and a half years in the Navy, the last part of which was uh, in San Francisco at Stanford Medical School. But here we are, surrounded by the hills which reached the sea, not very far from where I grew up in Pacific Palisades, back in the 20s and 30s. So, my perspective is, uh, especially in uh, infectious diseases, particularly those caused by viruses, uh, with experience in all continents except Antarctica, where we've visited but uh, not worked. What continents did you work in? North America, South America, Europe, Africa, and Asia, and Australia most recently. And you mentioned India. That's the subcontinent of Asia. Of Asia, yes. Where I was for five years and of course surrounded by rivers of uh, human contaminated water at different seasons of the year, sometimes flooding and sometimes a dry trickle, depending on whether the monsoon was on or off. But I had uh, numerous occasions to uh, visit and work in Calcutta I never made a single visit to Calcutta, but what you had la passed a dead body on the street or sidewalk, death was so common. And of course, Calcutta is where the British originally established their capital, at the junction of the Ganges and Brahmaputra River it flows through the Hooghly River out into the Bay of Bengal. But what happens there every year, the monsoon rains produce a flushing action which clears the filth and contamination out. But here we don't have 600 inches of rainfall the way they do in that area of India. So we don't get the annual flushing of the contamination that increasingly accumulates from the population increase as this part of the country, Southern California, develops. Well, now, the, uh, there is a flushing, though, in the Malibu Creek, as I understand it, that happens during the winter time when the storms come and all the waste that has been left on the sides of the canyon is carried by the first rainfalls into the ocean. Is that is that a different kind of flushing than would occur in the rivers of, of Calcutta? It, it's a minute flushing compared to the rivers of India. You know, when you get hundreds of inches of rainfall within a short period of three or four months, sometimes only two months, that's a lot of water flowing into the ocean and carries with it almost every year human populations, a human population larger than our population here in Malibu. But uh, Malibu Creek, at the time of maximum flush, you can't get rid of all of the accumulation of the effluent from the sewage treatment in the upper part of the canyon. No way. And over the years, of course, as the volume of uh, effluent has been poured down the river, the accumulation of chemicals that soaks into the ground, that doesn't flush. And you're getting a buildup 
of toxic chemicals that no one has measured yet. But it's going to continue to increase unless something is done to stop the effluent from being poured down Malibu Creek. The um, type of toxics that we're using here are different than any other toxics used around places in, in, uh, around the world. Am I correct? Well, in part, it's the relative volume of toxics. Uh, they use the same kinds of detergents that we use. They use uh, similar kinds of soap that we use. But uh, individuals sometimes just beat the dirt out of the clothes because they don't have enough money to buy detergents or soap. But that's not the problem here. The problem here is that the processed sewage as a pathogen-free effluent that is dumped in to the, to the uh, Malibu Creek contains chemicals that have not been removed. How do you know this? You can see it. You Wait. can look down there and you can see the discoloration on, on the uh, rocks. But seeing it, of course, is going to be argued uh, that just seeing it doesn't prove that that's what's there. Well, I'm sure if you go to the inner sanctum of uh, Tapia, they've got records of uh, their samplings of uh, the effluent. But of course, their primary purpose is to decontaminate it from uh, pathogens. Now, when you when you say you can see it, what what is it that you that you can visually um, recognize that? lets you know that it's toxics that are causing that visual well, impression. We know that uh, processed sewage according to code, the requirements of the uh, Water con uh, Quality Control Board and so forth, require uh, certain minimum uh, standards. Very often you can see froth which is a continuous presence of the detergent. And uh, as periods of time, you can see that in the creek as it runs down. What other uh, evidence is there, visual evidence, that you recognize as uh, toxic? elements that are... Well, as I say, I'm, I'm not a uh, party to what their determinations are, where they're sampling, what they're testing for, except that from the evidence that I've seen. But they, that's what I'm driving at, is you said you can see it. You can see the... Uh, you can see in the... You can see it too. Yeah. But, but I don't know what I'm looking at, well, having no experience like you have. Where, um, where do the uh, algae, which are unnatural uh, in, in that stream, get their nutrients? From a variety of sources, I understand, but where do you think? Mainly from the effluent that supports the growth during warm, warm weather, sunny weather. So algae is a byproduct of... of uh, it's an indicator. It's an indicator. But I think the whole thing is uh, the focus on uh, Malibu Creek and the possible passage of pathogens uh, that they don't detect because they have neither the technology nor the money to apply the technology is beside the point. In that stream, which is a scenic wonder, increasingly contaminated until it becomes a dead stream. We have many examples of dead streams like, due, to, due to the accumulation. Like what? Like where? Well, in, in the uh, Imperial Valley, for instance. They have to detoxify the water that they use to irrigate the vegetables that 
were exported all over the United States because of the increasing saturation of the soil. They've had to completely change their uh, farming practices so that the plants don't root into the salt. And when I say salt, I, I don't mean only sodium chloride. All the other salts, in the, uh, which include the nitrates that accumulate from the fertilizers that they use to grow the plants. There are uh, when you talk about uh, dead streams, dead streams can occur because you withhold water. Dead streams occur because they're poisoned. Dead streams are uh, the result of uh, withdrawal of water from aquifers underneath the ground so that above ground flow diminishes and then ceases. There are many different causes of dead streams. But this Malibu Creek will become a dead stream because of the accumulation of toxins. But your focus is on pathogens. Now, pathogens are something else again. Uh, you imply that there are cases... Excuse me, excuse me. I see what it is that's annoying you. It's an ant. <laughs> if you don't mind going back to that implies it implies, or you imply, that because uh, surfers report sick from pathogens that have come down Malibu Creek. Well, this begs the issue, uh, because you have no data, no laboratory diagnosis, no lab subject to uh, laboratory tests that would tell you perhaps what these infectious agents are that are making the people sick. And until you have quantitative data with appropriate tests on large enough samples frequently, we call this epidemiology, but until you have a way of collecting data on so-called illnesses and then testing them for certain pathogens, which can cause those illnesses. There's no evidence that uh, there's a pathogenic component to the effluent coming down Malibu Creek. There is a plan to do an epidemiological study. Um, and that study is proposed to be headed by UCLA. Um, what would be in your plan to do an epidemiological study? Well, unfortunately, uh, it's like a lot of studies that are financed at the present time by people being concerned about pathogenic contaminants of uh, sewage effluent, uh, fresh water, uh, water that's uh, from the melting snows that's passed over uh, previously accumulated uh, ponds and contaminated uh, de deposits of sand, a variety of things where they can pick these uh, pathogens up. But they're technology oriented, not pathogen oriented. In other words, these investigations are led what they can do cheapest uh, rather than what would cause the most severe illness or any illness at all. And the people that are undertaking this so-called epidemiological study, as I understand it, and of course I haven't seen the details of it, I just understand they're going after what viruses they can detect by the modern technology of probes. Well, a probe just indicates uh, what uh, has been there as uh, nucleoprotein 
of a supposedly pathogenic virus. It doesn't tell you whether it's infectious or not. So I would repeat, much of what is uh, soaking up a lot of money is the technology-led tests that are designed to pick up these things rather than finding out what you're looking for as a pathogen that produces disease or infection that would then give you a, a clue as to what you ought to be getting out of the effluent. So in your plan, you would look to... I don't have any plan. Um, well, I'm, I'm emeritus. Right. I've retired from that <laughs> business. <laughs> but well. in developing techniques to look for the viruses that we were looking for, I do know that uh, in the last uh, decade, Technology has replaced rationality in searching for what your enemies are as pathogens in the effluent. It's my understanding that epidemiological studies are inconclusive. At this point... Where do you get the understanding that epidemiological uh, studies are inconclusive? from Martine. No, I never <laughs> said that exactly. Well, I, I uh, looked at it from the standpoint of the article that you had presented at the Wastewater Management Study Group, which pointed out that even with a sourcing of 10,000 indicators, uh, it would still be inconclusive. And I looked to the uh, Health and Recreations Committee, where you had uh, attended the meeting for some kind of conclusion that could be drawn from an epidemiological study. And I said that since this article said it was inconclusive, why are we even having an epidemiological study? And I said, if we're going to have an epidemiological study, I would hope it would be conclusive rather than it leading to another study. And Martine, as I, as I recall, you, you said that uh, an epidemiological study is still not going to be conclusive. It can only it necessarily right. Well, that's the difference. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See now. Because you don't know what you're going to find. Okay. So, but I, but I'm trying to get from Dr. Work now, uh, if there's a possibility of getting a epidemiological study that would conclude there is pathogens at the highest risk level that are causing diseases to occur in the recreationalists at Surfriders Beach. Can we get an epidemiological study that would conclude that? Maybe the best way to answer that is through giving you a completely separate example. In 1980, one of our students from UCLA became the first virologist in Las Vegas. And as soon as they, she was established in the Southern Nevada Memorial Hospital, the new neurologists in Las Vegas, I think there were five of them, began sending her specimens from acute febrile cases of nervous system disease in short called encephalitis or at times aseptic meningitis due to a variety of viruses including those transmitted by arthropods particularly mosquitoes that we're familiar with in the west as western equine encephalitis and St. Louis encephalitis and since she had worked in our laboratory on our our project in Imperial Valley she knew this technology very well but here she was in a new situation where these uh, neurologists were sending specimens for a neurological a virus neurological diagnosis and so she called us up frequently to get advice finally after about three weeks we asked, well, would they like us to come and 
help solve this problem because the accumulation of cases was increasing. And you can imagine the panic if this hit the headlines in Las Vegas, it would affect the income of the community quite drastically, as we've seen in other situations. So we went to Las Vegas and after about two weeks, the expert, Dr. Josan Martin, and our student, Barris. And when we presented these results to the health department, the Clark County Health Department, they asked us to continue the epidemiological operation or study, investigation, which had definitely shown this was not Western equine encephalitis or St. Louis encephalitis. So we undertook a much larger project. And it then developed that most of these patients in Las Vegas hospitals in coma or paralyzed had come from St. George, Utah. So we went to St. George, Utah to follow up their original cases and found that they came from Bunkerville and Mesquite at the eastern border of Nevada. And to make a long story short, about three weeks later, we had demonstrated that these people had been infected from contaminated water of those two communities. It took another six months to establish that it was Coxsackie B-16. No. But anyhow, it was an enterovirus from contaminated drinking water that made them sick, so they went to St. George, the nearest hospital, and there when they became comatose, they were sent to the big city of Las Vegas where they could consult with neurologists. But the epidemiological study showed that it was not a mosquito-borne uh, neurotropic virus, but an intestinal or enteric virus of the, comp uh, of the complex known as Coxsackie viruses. No, no question about it. It was a specific enterovirus, but it took a while to establish that. But we started out with cases of human disease that were unconscious. And it went through all these stages. Using the technique, initially inoculation of uh, suckling mice and then tissue cultures of various kinds and then serological tests, so I'm trying to emphasize that a lot of epidemiological studies are instigated because they have this technique or that technique, and if it doesn't show anything, it doesn't mean nothing is there. It's technology-driven. The new epidemiologists are tied to their computers, and you, you know that you can do anything with statistics. Well then, if, if, as Dr. Josan points out, it's not necessarily conclusive, as in fact you just illustrated in your telling of it coming uh, as a, uh, a finding was drawn, uh, and then later it, wa it was followed to be a... Uh, coming from another place. Um, what you're suggesting then, if I'm, if I'm understanding you correctly, is that uh, to make it conclusive then, we've got to get away from a technology-driven epidemiological study to a epidemiological study... A disease-oriented epidemiological study. Which is disease-oriented. Or pathogen-oriented. This was an example of a pathogen-oriented study. We concluded that it was not mosquito-transmitted virus. If they said, okay, goodbye, they never would have known what caused it. But the cases would have continued, and they would have had a, an eruption of a panic, and people would have quit coming to Las Vegas. 
But fortunately, we kept it out of the newspapers and nobody knew what was going on except the health authorities who were the ones responsible for preventing further spread of the disease. So when you say it's pathogen driven, the conclusion that must be drawn then is based on finding what the pathogen is. What pathogen are you looking for? You have to establish. And that has to be done epidemiologically, systematically, by collecting cases, collecting information on the cases, finding out what the common signs and symptoms are, and then associating it with uh, a pathogen that is measured by its infectivity, its pathogenicity, and virulence. Three different qualities of a pathogen. Now, some of your surfers may have a fever. Some of them may have a visible uh, lesion. Some of them may have diarrhea. But they're all sick. But a number of pathogens can cause each one of these conditions. So you have to start with the illness and then diagnose the illness as being a certain kind of pathogen. For instance, influenza is one of the most highly infectious viruses we know of. Within uh, 24 to 48 hours, exposure to an acute case of influenza produces another one or 10 more and so forth. And we're all familiar with winter epidemics of influenza. But most people recover. So even though it's highly infectious, it's not particularly pathogenic because you recover. But there are certain strains of it in certain uh, human hosts, such as uh, infants and old people, where it will kill. So the virulence of the virus is potential. You want to find out which virus you're dealing with, and of course that guides each year's vaccine production which resists the infection by whatever strain they expect to happen that year of influenza B or influenza A virus. There we're looking for a specific pathogen. There's surveillance all over the United States, in fact all over the world through the World Health Organization of laboratories that can look for the pathogen and to be able to type and characterize the pathogen in terms not of infectivity so much as pathogenicity and virulence. Do you understand uh, how epidemiology of influenza works? Now a different epidemiology would be for say uh, poliomyelitis, infantile paralysis. There are three types of virus that cause infantile paralysis. And they're components of either the Salk or the Sabin vaccine, depending on which is selected to immunize the person. But the epidemiology of a case of uh, poliomyelitis, infantile paralysis, depends on pursuing the proper materials collected from the patient. But we know the pathogenesis of this disease, which ultimately is a neurotropic virus that destroys the uh, myelin covering of the nerves leading to the muscles producing paralysis, is 35 or more days compared to 24 to 48 hours for influenza. That's epidemiology. And finally you end up, which was it, type 1, type 2, or type 3? Polio virus. So you cannot say, I'm going to choose uh, monkey kidney tissue culture, or I'm going to choose uh, porcine, or I'm going to choose an equine strain. You have to know what you're looking for. And the first clues to that are what, it's like our current mystery disease in uh, the Navajo Reserve Reservation of Arizona and New Mexico. 
And uh, as soon as they associated the disease with rodents, they went back to look up what would produce fatal disease so rapidly in association with rodents. Hantavirus. What's hantavirus? Well, it's a virus we ran into in Korea as Korean hemorrhagic fever. But there are all kinds of varieties in different parts of the world. Most of our knowledge about it originally was elucidated by the Soviets when they encountered the disease in the Primorsky province of Siberia. And here it is. But we had to have people, epidemiologists, who knew how to go out and ask the questions of the patients, ask the questions of the environment. And it mostly occurred on the Indian reservation. And finally they got to a suspicion that it was hantavirus and tested, and as I understand it now, at least three of the survivors have antibodies in their blood to hantavirus that they shouldn't have, except that this has been a reservoir by these wild rodents all these years. Now you pointed out two points of facts. One is that there were epidemiologists who were qualified and had the background to be able to coordinate the information and assess what the, or determine what the virus was based on comparisons and working knowledge of what, what was out there. Also, you pointed out uh, two different kinds of epidemiological studies, one with a long-term uh, infectious period, one with a short-term infectious period. Um, and in the Malibu Creek area, with the planned epidemiological study that, they're, that they've got at this point in the planning stages, um, it seems that we're experiencing a variety of different diseases from hepatitis to uh, staph infections to uh, uremic poisoning to uh, a variety of different uh, diseases. Uh, when you call for a pathogen-driven epidemiological study, um, it would seem to me that we would need an epidemiological study that would be driven over a variety of different uh, channels so we could find what the various diseases are coming from. Um, yet my concern is that we're having a technologically driven epidemiological study. If you were, and I respect your uh, amaritis status, if you were, uh, at this point, planning an epidemiological study for the Malibu Creek watershed, given the knowledge you have of the various diseases that are being contracted there, what epidemiological study would you recommend be undertaken? Well, I don't know enough about uh what they've already started to do, so I'm a Monday morning quarterback on that. I see. But if you ask me, the first thing, I'd want to see the patients that claim to be sick. How are you going to do that? Well, we have um, um, a number of case scenarios that are available uh, documented with uh, a number of the medical practitioners here in Malibu um, and to get to those uh, th that those individuals names excuse me are uh, and their contact numbers are available um, although there is one case scenario I would like to question you on which is the hepatitis C virus that George Tr Trudeau contracted um, um, and he pointed out to me that uh, his doctor said the, cock the uh, hepatitis C virus could have taken a year before it surfaced. Um, 
given that he's also stated that he's got hepatitis C for the rest of his life, how can one undertake an epidemiological study if I were to present him to you now and that he still has hepatitis C? I haven't seen the patient, first of all. Yes. So, uh... I, is it unfair of me to try to pin you down on No, on it's a, not uh, unfair. Epidemiological I mean, uh, study plan? Why should plan? it be unfair? You, you came to ask me questions about something I've had experience with, and I've had a fair amount of experience with uh, hepatitis since World War II. It's been an enigma for a long period of time, and now we know there are at least five different types of viral hepatitis. One time we thought there was only one, and then two, uh, hepatitis B associated with uh, surgery or uh, inoculations of various kinds. We called it serum hepatitis, and hepatitis A was enteric hepatitis, a virus that passes through the intestinal tract and it contaminates uh, feces and uh, by the contaminated feces ingested by other people, they get hepatitis A. But now we know, and hepatitis E was an epidemic of 40,000 cases that we studied in New Delhi, India in 1956. 40,000 cases in one community, and it was due to the Jumna River uh, subsiding in level so that they started using the effluent from Old Delhi flowing uphill into the water intake of New Delhi's municipal water supply. But that's a, another long story. But viral hepatitis clinically is similar. But we now know that there are five different viruses that cause it and many other pathogens. Yellow fever is a hepatitis. That's what the yellow fever uh, virus does. It destroys the liver tissue. But you can have hepatitis from uh, cancer, hepatitis from parasitic disease, so it takes some uh, contact with the patient. What are the difficulties? And then there are laboratory tests. The first thing you do is test for uh, abnormal function of the liver. The enzyme tests tell you whether the liver is normal or whether there's something wrong with the function of the liver cells. And we do that with a chemical test. How, how would you guard against misleading epidemiological studies? What would you make sure was in place for the proposition of a well thought out epidemiological study? Well, you've got two things to start with. You have to have somebody with some uh, knowledge of uh, pathogenic processes that might or might not be due to a virus or a bacterium or a parasite or a blockage of uh, cancer or any number of things. Uh, alcohol toxicity, that's one of the commonest causes of hepatitis there is, is overconsumption of alcohol. But you have to have somebody that know, knows how to differentiate the, between these and knows which test to order from the laboratory to confirm the suspicion. But the other part of the study is a systematic system for collecting cases. I mean, you can have the same disease occurring due to five, ten different causes in a larger population. Well, I don't know what what kind of epidemiological, uh, I mean epidemiologists um, are around or how many there are around and being a layman uh, in the field of science, um, I would like to know uh, are there many epidemiologists around who could qualify for 
undertaking an epidemiological study? Are there only a handful? Yeah, there are many and there are only a handful. <laughs> it's a trick answer. <laughs> well, you want me to explain it? Yes, please. Um, so you were saying about... You, you asked a question about epidemiology and epidemiologists. About epidemiologists. And uh, you, the trick answer is what you gave me. <laughs> in other words, uh, you, you want to know uh, what the minimum requirements are for somebody to really seriously design an epidemiological study to answer the questions you've raised about the, the surf riders. Well, I think the best way to explain it is that the American Public Health Association, which is a professional association for public health workers in the United States is divided into the sections. And at last count, I think they had 25,000 people who selected the epidemiology section for their membership. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, we have a distinguished organization called the American Epidemiological Society. And I think the last uh, number uh, limited to uh, membership was 150 in the whole United States. And those are people who are recognized for accomplishment in epidemiology. And in between, there are hundreds of epidemiologists or people who call themselves epidemiologists or who by function are epidemiologists, such as those turned out by the CDC every year, numbering about 50 after two years of training and experience. These people, mostly physicians, but they can be veterinarians, they can be public health nurses, they can be other people who are epidemiologists. And these are people who are fully engaged in the epidemiology of a disease or the application of epidemiology to a wide variety of problems or operate some tool in the epidemiological studies that are continuing to go on. For instance, probably the largest number of uh, non-practitioner people engaged in AIDS research are epidemiologists of different kinds. And their training can be in the laboratory with the different kinds of laboratory tests. This is one of the problems with AIDS. How do you diagnose it early enough and on what criteria? Well, this is an evolving uh, definition, so that from one year to the next, you can't really tell whether there's a pro pro progression or an expansion of cases. But it was epidemiology that elucidated AIDS to begin with. Uh, do you think it'll be epidemiology which will come to... No, not now uh, the people who are dealing effectively with the cases, particularly in the uh, areas where it's concentrated, like San Francisco and New York and Los Angeles, uh, it was an epidemiologist that recognized uh, the cases in Los Angeles, Don Francis, who came here from CDC to investigate the unusual circumstance, a high attack rate of primary cancer of the liver in a West Hollywood population that turned out to be homosexual. And this led to Dr. Gottlieb's clinic where Kaposi's tumor was of special interest in young men. And they put two and two together and it 
these were the earliest cases that there was a scientific epidemiological association between clinical disease and HIV infection before HIV was known. That's epidemiology in action. Well, Don Francis is an excellent epidemiologist. Dr. Gottlieb is a clinician dealing with the disease, but he certainly knows a lot about the epidemiology of AIDS. On the other hand, without the assistance of the various techniques, including computers, now there are many computer jockeys who work full-time in epidemiology uh, programs of county health departments, state health departments, NIH. Uh, it's an eclectic science in the whole uh, very discipline of medical science. You can't do a proper job unless you have an epidemiological insight into whatever medical problem you're dealing with. For instance, there's now a relationship between an, uh, uh, an alarming increase in tuberculosis cases in Southern California associated with illegal immigrants. That answer comes from epidemiology. But first you have to diagnose the case of tuberculosis. When you do, then you find out all the things you can about it, where they came from. Then you test everybody else within their family sphere of influence. So epidemiology ranges all the way from a highly sophisticated uh, practice in uh, public health to uh, technical, very important, competent technical activity in taking figures and even extrapolating them into expectations. So when you ask what is an epidemiologist, you have to look as what their interests are. You have uh, pointed out that there are a couple of concerns apparently that exist in the creek. One is toxics, the other is pathogens. Um, with an epidemiological study, would you concur that the proposal of a pathogenic directed epidemiological study would be appropriate? And a second part to that question is, is there a tox toxicity epidemiological study that can be done? The answer to the last question first. You can't do an adequate study of uh, the impact of uh, effluent from a sewage treatment plant without doing the epidemiology of the non-pathogenic or uh, non-infectious pathogens such as toxins and get anywhere near to an effective answer on which to build a preventive program. I didn't make the point when describing epidemiologists, many of them are professors of preventive medicine because preventive medicine is built upon the epidemiological studies of preventable disease like tuberculosis, like poliomyelitis, like yellow fever, like influenza, like AIDS, and now like this new uh, Hanta virus related to wild rodents. That's epidemiology. So in medical centers, you very often have the senior person wearing two hats. His specialty is in preventive medicine, but his experience and expertise is in epidemiology, because that's basic to prevention of disease, and that's what you're trying to do. So you need a rather sophisticated experienced epidemiologist to look at the problem. But uh, 
my conclusion at this point is the effluent shouldn't be going down Malibu Creek at all because there shouldn't be any input from those developing, those massive, rapidly developing contributors to the, the sewage treatment that the plant is undertaking now, let alone what it'll be five years, 10 years, 15 years from now. What do you propose they should do? On-site treatment. Why should uh, Malibu become the Calcutta of Southern California? That's a good question. <laughs> I don't think it should. But and it will. You're foreseeing that? Of course I foresee it. Unless we can start promoting on-site treatment of wastewater. And there's technology now where you can deal with this. Formerly, when we didn't know much about viruses, and that's 30 years ago, I've grown up with the knowledge of virology. When I went to medical school, we had chemotherapeutic agents like the sulfonamides and uh, quinine for uh, malaria. I was in at the beginning of the testing of penicillin against venereal diseases like syphilis and gonorrhea. And then came the vaccines in the 50s, somewhat effective for influenza, but very effective for poliomyelitis and other virus diseases like yellow fever. So that by the beginning of my <coughs> active career, I, I was warned against going into infectious diseases because they'd all been conquered by chemotherapeutic agents, antibiotics, and vaccines. Were you convinced? No. <laughs> Being perverse, but to my exposure to uh, disease populations around the world as a medical officer in the Navy, going to various tropical countries at the end of the war, I saw enough sick people in disease, fascinating to me, the biology of disease is what led me into all of this. Do you think that, or do you know if diseases can mutate? Is there an end goal to diseases where we can conquer diseases? It, it seems that you're suggesting no. No. As a biologist, I know that parasites will always develop a system of survival. The closer they get to extinction, the hardier they become. Well, they've, they've exterminated smallpox from the world, at least for the time being. But that's the only disease I know of that's been eradicated in my lifetime. Other diseases have been controlled through epidemiological study and then measures of prevention or control, but not eradication. Well, it seems that we're going to have to live with diseases for generations upon generations then, and that the scientists will look to conquer those new diseases as they come upon us. Um, at this point we have it seems to me a practical problem and that's an archaic method of disposing of our waste uh, well this was done initially the first thing uh, well the, the cholera epidemic at the Broad Street pump which is the classic epidemiological study of the last century where they associated the Broad Street pump with the supply of uh, community water and the only people that uh, didn't get sick were the workers in the beer factory because they could drink all the beer they wanted for free. That's simple epidemiology. And they, then those people that got sick were associated with the Broad Street pump. 
same way as uh, measles in the Faroe Islands. The Faroe Islands are 19 islands in the North Atlantic lying between the Shetlands and uh, Iceland. I've been there many times because it's a fabulous place to see birds. And, uh, but a physician to the Danish court that's had tight control over the Faroe Islands for centuries as one of the old Viking conquests. They sent this physician to investigate this febrile disease occurring with a rash in the populace of isolated Faroe Islands. And that's where we learned about the incubation period, transmission, uh, person to person transmission of measles from the study of Panem, Dr. Panem on measles, a classic epidemiological study associated with the outbreak of an unusual disease for that population because they weren't continuously s exposed to measles. Now I could go on because we use these right. examples for, for teaching. Well, what, I, what I'm trying to get at here is that um, a question as to whether your opinion, is, as to what your opinion is on the method of using our creeks and our rivers as vehicles for discharging the waste. Is it, what is your opinion of that? I think that's just putting off to the day of reckoning. None of these creeks should be a dumping ground for effluent from sewage treatment. Now, epidemiologically, we began to associate enteric disease like cholera in the first instance but other enteric diseases a diarrheal diseases hepatitis we've already talked about with sewage contaminated water now what do you do in that case well you purify the water by the application of chlorine whether by gas or by chlorides or whatever you do to add to the water, but as soon as you do that, you set up other chemical complexes that didn't enter that system, but they come out with the effluent, various chlorides, along with the nitrates and so forth. So that's when they developed the bacterial measure of treatment to remove pathogenic bacteria from the water supply. And I can remember as a kid, the Department of Water and Power used to come around once a week to various hydrants in Pacific Palisades, collect a sample of water. And I learned later that they would cultivate uh, that bacterially for 24 hours and then count the colonies of coliform bacteria. And if they were above a certain point, they'd up the dose of chlorine or do something else to lower that count which was supposed to take care of all the pathogens. Well, in 1956, they did that in, in India, but it, it didn't affect the viruses, even though the ultimate dose of chlorine was two and a half times the maximum level. So pathogens get through in spite of how much chlorine that, that you put in, because you get up to a certain mass action beyond which nascent chlorine is no longer available. So epidemiology in the hands of medical scientists elucidate the problems. They then develop preventive measures and hand it over to the engineers, the sanitary engineers who are the greatest soldiers in the whole system because they're the ones that implement and monitor and maintain effectiveness of purification of water or sewage effluent, such as the engineers at Tapia. I'm very happy that the engineers are uh, in the Tapia plant, but it's time to think, think about something that would put them out of a job, and they don't want to be out of a job. What do you think that something is? On-site disposal of sewage. Now, 
the Tapia treatment plant claims their tertiary treated water is not this drink, is, this is not drinkable, number one, and they also claim that it's the best treated water that can be treated with any kind of system that exists today. Do you agree but, or disagree? But in Calabasas, we heard about the anticipated increase many times over of the present uh, sewage going into that treatment plant for which they're enlarging it just right. to accommodate the already agreed upon uh, treatment of the sewage effluent. Well, now, how will uh, 10 years from now <laughs> Malibu Creek look? It'll be a dead creek. But you, you're, you're pointing to quantity. What I'm looking at is tertiary treated water as a quality of water. Is tertiary treated water, as you know it, safe to be discharged down the creek? Well, they do have one advance, and that is uh, treatment or use of treated water for uh, non-human purposes, such as the irrigation of plants and so forth. Well, then but modern technology has developed the reverse osmosis uh, possibility of really filtering this stuff. There, there's a plant in Santa Barbara. There's a plant in Santa Nofre. There's a, there are plants all over California where they're doing on-site treatment of contaminated water, which we know is going to increase many times over as the population increases. And for the same amount of money that they're going to pay for this water, they could use treated water by reverse osmosis. And uh, there are other ways, ozonization, which they can get rid of the nitrates and the sulfites and so forth. But they're not looking at that now. They're only looking at an expansion of the plant to take care of Agreed. the increased population. Agreed. And we're at the anus right. of this intestine. And we are the, 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 uh, the ultimate receptacle at this That's point. That's right. Um, it seems that there is a uh, approach which is to, uh, and, I'm, and I'm, I might be veering away from your expertise, your field of science, and getting into a little politics here, but I think everybody somewhat dabbles in politics, um, so I'm venturing a question to you on a political level, or it tends to be on a political level, not, in, not in intentionally meant to be political, but just your perspective uh, is what I'm asking on how would you approach um, changing over the methodology, which apparently you agree is archaic now, of using the creek as a vehicle to discharge waste, um, and, and converting everybody's mindset to using on-site uh, disposal of waste. How would you approach that problem with the population and its cultural upbringing today? How would you convert them to using on-site? You see what I mean? It's a political question. <laughs> well, I'm not a politician. I know. <laughs> and I wouldn't be sitting there. And, and uh, my biggest problems in my life have been political problems. I mean, just the other day, we got a notice they're raising the water rates. Yeah. Well, combine that to an increase, a manifold increase in quantity of water upstream, regardless of everything else, the cost is going to go up in spite of the need to cut down on the amount of water. And one of the ways to cut down on the amount of water, uh, economically correct, is to have on-site disposal. 